Coming up next on the Passion Struck Podcast. Every voice is not being heard. A small number of people are disproportionately dominating the conversation. Imagine being at a dinner party where just one person talked the whole time and the other eight people had to kind of silently sit there as they, well, they got kind of yelled at and lectured and talked over. That's the dynamic of social media in practice, not in theory. In theory, everybody gets to talk. It's the ultimate democratizing technology, right? But in practice, that's not what happens. Welcome to Passion Struck. Hi, I'm your host, John R. Miles, and on the show, we decipher the secrets, tips, and guidance of the world's most inspiring people and turn their wisdom into practical advice for you and those around you. Our mission is to help you unlock the power of intentionality so that you can become the best version of yourself. If you're new to the show, I offer advice and answer listener questions on Fridays. We have long form interviews the rest of the week with guests ranging from astronauts to authors, CEOs, creators, innovators, scientists, military leaders, visionaries, and athletes. Now, let's go out there and become passion struck. I am so excited to welcome Jay Van Bavel to the Passion Struck podcast. Welcome, Jay. Hi, John. It's a pleasure to be here. Well, I am so excited to have you. I am a huge fan of behavioral science and behavioral economics, and I saw that you were connected with the Behavioral Change for Good initiative that Katie Milkman and Angela Duckworth co-lead. What made you want to join that? And what do you think is the significance of what they're doing? I mean, tell you, to be honest, I think that what they're doing is one of the very best ways of doing science. I think they're at the absolute cutting edge. They're real pioneers in bringing together the world's eating minds on different topics, getting all their ideas, and then testing them in kind of formal tournaments to see what is the best idea and how effective are they. And so I've been doing similar types of research out of my lab at New York University, and a lot of it aligns exactly with theirs. I think this is the absolute best way to do behavioral science right now, and they're two of the smartest people around doing it. Well, I know academia, because of the grants and other things, can be competitive. So I just love that these mega studies are being done because the results end up helping every single person who's involved. So. I agree with you. And it's one of the big reasons I'm supporting what they're doing as well, because I think behavioral science more than anything can influence someone's life in the short term. The other thing is that it's using the very best methods possible. So there's a lot of behavioral science that's interesting, but really small samples or only tests one idea and it doesn't really compare to other ideas to see what's better. And so I think what you're really seeing now in the last four or five years, really, it's emerging, and there's only a small number of groups doing it, are these massive studies, which are using huge samples that are more diverse on topics that that we actually care about, where they're trying to make a difference in the real world, and in ways that compare different theories. And so it's kind of combining, in my view, the best of all possible worlds. And I'll say like 10 years ago, these did not exist. These are a new thing. That's why I think they're really innovative, and it's really the best way to go forward. I also think it gives the best insights that people in the real world can actually use because they can actually trust the data and then learn what works best. If they want to apply it to their own life, that's the best evidence that they can use. Well, I think that's great. And I did want to ask you about a recent study that you did. I saw on your Twitter page and you're very active on there. So I love how much you're sharing about behavioral science. So if anyone who's listening to this wants to check out a great Twitter feed, about this, I would highly recommend yours. Yeah, where you can find me. (laughs) But I saw yesterday that you posted on Twitter a new paper you did assessing 742 scientific articles around human behavior from COVID. And I wanted to ask you about that and maybe have you explain it, but what some of the surprising findings your team uncovered. Yeah, so maybe I'll go back two and a half years Um, So right before the United States started locking down in COVID, so early March 2020, where there was a small number of cases of COVID, I, along with Rob Wheeler, who's a sociologist at Stanford, organized a team of 41 experts. And we tried to figure out, based on the last 50 years of social and behavioral science, what is the best possible advice that we could give to people who are developing policy or running studies during the pandemic? And so we published this paper. We wrote it in like two weeks with all these people, all these experts. And then it got published by April of 2020. And so during that time, cities and countries started locking down. So it came out right at the beginning of the pandemic. It was kind of the first big paper on the pandemic from people like us. 
And our paper, to our surprise, generated a lot of controversy. Some people thought, well, social and behavioral scientists really don't have anything to add here. They should just shut up and let the politicians do the speaking. Some people were like, well, maybe your advice is going to backfire or won't work. And so there's a lot of kind of like speculation about how good social and behavioral science was. At the, on the same hand, so that was like one group of critics. But on the other hand, our paper exploded in popularity. I think it's been read over half a million times. Rob and I were invited to give talks to Congress, to senatorial committees, to the World Health Organization, consult with the United Nations. So meanwhile, all these people were taking it seriously. But at the same time, we were like, okay, well, we should take the critics seriously and see how accurate we were. And so we teamed up with Kai Ruggieri. He's a public health professor at Columbia University. And we said, Kai, we're going to let you analyze all this data. We're going to help you, but you're going to be the final person who's going to see all the analysis. We're going to take the original group of authors. We're going to go through all the papers that have been published on COVID and social and behavioral science in the last two and a half years. And then you need to create another team that's also going to read all those same things and rate them in a formal way. And we'll see if our ratings are the same. And we're going to see if our predictions came true, if the ideas and proposals we had in our paper at the beginning of the pandemic actually predicted how real people behave during the pandemic. And so I'll tell you as a scientist, this is kind of like a pulse racing exercise <laughs> because you're letting someone else evaluate your ideas and you don't know if they're going to be good or bad or backfire. And so Kai did this, he organized it. He kept us blind from the other teams so that we couldn't influence them or be influenced by them. We all rated these 740 articles. And then he texted me and he said, I've got the results. We're ready to write the paper. And so I said, okay, uh, what are the results? How accurate were we? And he said, you were accurate on 16 of the 18 claims where we had data. So 89% accuracy of our predictions from our paper. And the other two claims were just kind of like null. They weren't, but nothing backfired, which was kind of the fear that some people wow. had. Nothing backfired at all. And almost 90% of the time we were precise in predicting what would generate real human behavior at scale during a pandemic. This was one of the most impressive, rigorous analyses that I've ever done or seen in my history of being in the field for 20 years, probably the best. And I only played a small role in it. Kai was led the team of about 76 scholars who did all these analyses. And so it's just a real affirmation of the value of social and behavioral science during the biggest crisis, the biggest experiment in behavior change in my lifetime, probably in the last hundred years. And so, I mean, I'm really pleased by it. And I think it says something really important that we can actually, the science that we have, the best of it can tell us important things. Well, speaking of Twitter, I know you like to examine the impacts of different social media and what it's having on people. And I have an episode I did on digital addiction and how it's impacting human connection, but you look at it through the lens of polarization. And I was hoping you could discuss some of the work that you're doing and the results that are coming out of it. Yeah, so I would say about seven or eight years ago, I started becoming interested in social media and how it was changing our behavior, how we thought about things, how we could engage with other people. And I will say at first, I was a huge advocate for social media. I, I was on Facebook early on. I was an early adopter of that. I was on Twitter pretty early. And I'm on LinkedIn and I have Instagram accounts and all these things. So I use it pretty frequently, as you pointed out <laughs> a few minutes ago. But I started to realize there might be a downside to it. I noticed even when scientists would debate things, they would start to get moralistic and polarize. And so you take an issue where there was, you talk to people privately and they would say, oh, I'm iffy, but you'd watch them on Twitter and they'd be like a flamethrower and super partisan about some boring methods issue where normally at the old days of just going to the conference, you would see like very reasoned, nuanced discussions. And so I started to think, well, maybe it's changing how we interact with one another and think. And so I had this, uh, a couple of amazing PhD students, uh, Julian Wills, who went to work on fa at Facebook after he did his PhD, and Billy Brady, who's now a professor at Northwestern. And we decided they were interested in like morality and emotions. And so I said, let's test this on Twitter. And so what we found in our very first research, we analyzed over 500,000 tweets on hot button political topics. And what we found is when people use a moral emotional word, like disgusting or make, fills me with contempt, that it would be about 15 to 20% more likely to be retweeted. And so you could load up your messages with two or three or four or five of those words, and it would dramatically increase the likelihood that it was spread or went viral. So that is what you're doing when you're like using language. You're looking to see what spreads. You might be using that language more in the future. You find that like language like moral emotions or moral outrage is more likely to resonate with people. It builds you followers. It gets you clout. 
But on the other side, what we found when we looked at who was retweeting it was that if you were sharing this position using this language, it was only getting shared by people who were already like you. So it created the appearance of what looked like echo chambers with mm. people on the right only sharing moral emotional messages from other people on the right and people on the left only sharing moral emotional messages from people on the left. And so it seems like a double-edged sword. You can use this messaging to spread your message, but it kind of comes at the cost of alienating people who you might be trying to persuade. So it seems like a really good rhetoric for mobilizing people, but also at the consequence of alienating people. Well, I'm glad you brought up the whole topic of echo chambers, because it's something I wanted to cover. And we're going to jump into now discussing your book, The Power of Us, which although it released in September 2021, it has had a remarkably positive following. So congratulations on that. I think it was chapter four that you discuss echo chambers and media playing both sides and doing these information campaigns, or if you want to call them disinformation campaigns. How do things like that become bias creating and create these echo chambers? And what are the ramifications on us that this is happening? Yeah, I mean, I've been increasingly concerned about misinformation and fake news and conspiracy theories and how those spread on social media. There was some research that kind of triggered all of this on social media, and they found that stories that had been fact-checked, they found that the ones that were wrong were spreading faster and further on social media, especially on Twitter. And it was really the stories that were about politics and had emotion embedded in them. So morality and emotion, identity, those types of messages are the things that kind of seem to mobilize misinformation spreading. People aren't spreading misinformation about like cats and dogs. They're spreading misinformation about their political opponents. And so a small number of people are generating this misinformation, but once it gets spread on social media, a lot of people see it and it could potentially impact a lot of people. And it's often very divisive information. And so what we've been finding, I'll just tell you about this new paper where we just submitted it a couple of days ago, where we did a, a survey of all Americans, representative survey, Republicans, Democrats, independents. And what we found is that people think that divisive, hateful misinformation is going, is being amplified by these social media platforms and they hate it. They don't like it. They wish that information that was true, that was more positive, that was more factual and more accurate was actually being amplified on social media platforms. And these effects were whopping and they were totally bipartisan is that you see this almost identical patterns for Republicans and Democrats. And so there is a sense that kind of we're all being sucked into this matrix of divisive content and misinformation and people don't like it, but they're kind of all part of it because that's, as I said already, that's kind of what gets rewarded. That's what gets shared. That's what's what gets you likes. That's what gets you followers in, in some of these communities. And we're all trying to like shout louder because everybody else is shouting. I think of social media a little bit like when I go for dinner in New York where I live, it's like they crank up the music and you're trying to have a conversation at your table and all of a sudden you can't really hear the person. So you have to talk louder, you start shouting. And then the people at the table next to you suddenly can't hear their self. So they have to shout louder, which means you have to shout louder. And eventually everybody's yelling and you can't hear anything. And it just really makes for an awful experience for everybody. But you're all kind of sucked into this because that's an environment that's been created. And I feel like that's a little bit what's happened on social media. The term is attention economy. So you have 4 billion people on social media now around the world. The average social media user is on there for almost three hours a day. And if you have a smartphone, which almost all of us do now, the average person scrolls through 300 feet. So 600 swipes of their social media news feed a day. That's the height of the Statue of Liberty. So we don't have time to read it or think about it deeply, try to understand it, look at the context, read the articles. We're really reacting to things that are triggering us, that are attention grabbing, that are kind of outrageous. It's if you're driving down the freeway and you see a car in a car crash, you stop and stare at it because it's interesting. But no one wants to live in a world where there's just car crashes all the way down the freeway. That's a pretty scary, dangerous, awful world to live in. But that's a little bit kind of what the vibe is, I think, on some social media platforms now. Yeah, for the research I did on my article, I found that the average person touches their phone, I think it was 3,216 times a day. What? 3,016? Wait, say that again. <laughs> it was 3,216 3, times was the research I found. Wow. which just seems impossible. <laughs> I mean, I surely don't touch mine that much, but just I know that down because that's like blows my mind. But yet I believe it. If we're scrolling through 300 feet, that means we're probably touching it at least 600 times, if not many more. So, yeah. Well, their usage data coincided with yours. I think they were at 
three hours, 21 minutes, something yeah. like that. So it, it very makes complete sense. Very similar. Well, what are your thoughts about Elon Musk entering this social domain? Do you think he's going to keep these algorithms the same at Twitter, or do you think we're going to see them change pretty drastically? Okay, so let me tell you where I agree and disagree with Elon. I'm not one of those people who's pro-Elon or anti-Elon. I actually think he has some terrible ideas and some great ideas. Like most human beings, we have some good ideas and bad ideas. One thing that he wants to do that we found is totally consistent with our survey of uh, Americans was that he wanted to make the algorithm transparent. And that was something that a huge majority, I think like 80 to 90% of Americans thought was a good idea. And again, that's across age groups and whether you're Democrat or Republican, that seems like something people like that. They want more transparency and they also want more control over their algorithm. If he did, that would be great. I think one thing that he proposed doing is kind of having like a rampant free speech model, which anybody can go on there and say anything, harass anybody, spread any kind of misinformation. I think that's bad. And there's lots of research on this with content platforms where there's, when you have moderators who are making sure there's not like harassment and hate, pe more people will stay on longer because they don't want to be in a really toxic environment. If you allow the environment to go completely toxic and you don't manage these types of threats and harassment and misinformation, people disengage or leave the platform or it just creates more conflict. And our data overwhelmingly, and again, this is not just my opinion, this is the data of a representative sample of Americans from both parties. People don't like misinformation or divisive content or outrage or hate spewing at them nonstop from their social media. And so my prediction would be that people from, again, across the political spectrum, if they were actually subjected to more of that on Twitter, would disengage more and move to other platforms. Yes, I think it's going to be an interesting change one way or the other. But it's interesting. I'm not sure if Douglas Rushkoff, he used to teach at NYU. He's now at CUNY Queens. But he has a new book out now called Survival of the Richest. And we were talking about some of these social platforms and how the technology is being used. And I do think he has a point that technology was supposed to be an enabler. It was supposed to build community. Yet the way that these companies are generating their profits is through individuals. And so they are really driving us into individualism in many ways based on these platforms and away from community. Do you see that as well as you look at this through the lens of identity? Yeah, I mean, that's a great comment. I actually think it's pretty complex, which I think about most issues, as you could tell, that I was excited about these platforms because of that exact same reason. But let me explain how it's tricky to build community. So one thing that Facebook decided, this is from talking to a lot of staffers at Facebook and reading news stories, I learned that a few years ago, they made a decision to move away from amplifying content that's shared news. And they want it to be more a place where you spend talking to people you care about, maximize kind of social connection and community. And so they allegedly changed the algorithm to amplify engaging content. And so when they did that, rather than kind of news stories, and so that like had some consequences of downrating the number of news or news sites that you saw in your feed. The famous one was, goodness, there was a very viral website that was supposed to share positive news, but it had tons of clickbait. And eventually people got sick of the clickbait. So they wanted different people to talk about like life events. But what they found is that, and comment and share thoughts in the, in the sections of when people shared something about their life. So they tried to change the algorithm to amplify that, but it had an unintended consequence of amplifying conflict <laughs> because <laughs> it just led to people yelling at each other instead of at like your family Thanksgiving dinner. It was like on social media, arguing about politics or sharing hateful content that really triggered people to, to comment on it. And so it had an unintended consequence that they didn't really foresee. And so even with the best of intentions, sometimes you can get these unintended consequences if you don't anticipate kind of the political environment that you're doing it in. And so I do think that like social media can be good for bringing people together. But as I said, it often comes with a double-edged sword of alienating people and creating conflict. So I think a lot more like thought needs to go into how to create these virtual spaces to make them better. I would say that I'm not like a technophobe. I don't think that these things are gonna go away. As I said, 4 billion people are online and it's growing. So I think the real mission for us as scientists, as a society is to figure out how do we want to make this healthier? So our relationships are damaged, our community doesn't generate more conflict or tip into civil war. How do we make it healthy and safe for our kids? Like my kids who are pretty young, open their own like Snapchat and TikTok accounts. 
And so it's like, I have to have conversations with them about how to use those in healthy ways. But I also hope that these platforms are having like, I know many of them are trying to figure out how to make them healthier. So I think this is one of the kind of big challenges for our society and in our generation is we have this new technology, just like we have regulations around what can go on TV and what can be said and what can be shown during certain times of the day. We had this debate, you know, almost 100 years ago with newspapers in the early days of yellow journalism, which was a lot like misinformation and propaganda. We changed the norms and the training and professionalism of journalism. We should be having these conversations right now for social media. And they shouldn't just be like a small number of people. It should really be society. Every voice deserves to be heard on this because it really, I think, affects all of us. Yes. And when I think of technology, and that's where I spent a great percentage of my career was as a chief information officer, chief information security officer, software company CEO. I look at a lot of the technology that's being built right now. And sometimes we as boards, we as leaders, we as entrepreneurs don't think through the ramifications because oftentimes we're not looking through it through the lens of what an adversary or a bad actor would look at it through. And an example of that is I remember I can't remember what to watch it was, but U.S. military members were having this for GPS and the soldiers were deploying, but a foreign government was actually hacking into it and they were able to read the data on it, something that I think it was Fitbit never thought in a million years would happen, I am sure, when they designed that technology. So I think the same thing is happening with different things that are coming out of these social companies and other technologies around community and other things that are happening now. So it's going to be interesting in the years to come how we do what you're just saying and start policing this more by trying to envision what the potential uses of the technology could be outside of their intended use. Yeah, I say there's a couple of points I'd make about that. One is that the conversation, as I said, is driven by the people at the extremes. So even if you go onto social media, the vast majority of comments on any topic, but especially like on politics, are driven by people who are at the extremes. They're online the most, they're sharing the most content, they're dominating the conversation, they more easily build huge followings. And that ends up leaving out 80% of the population from the conversation. They just get drowned out or they don't want to stick their neck out and get have it get chopped off. And so you're not really having a democratic conversation. Every voice is not being heard. A small number of people are being disproportionately dominating the conversation. Imagine being at a dinner party where just one person talked the whole time and the other eight people had to kind of silently sit there as they yelled at and lectured and talked over. That's the dynamic of social media and in practice, not in theory. In theory, everybody gets to talk. It's the ultimate democratizing technology, right? But in practice, that's not what happens. That's why I'm doing these representative samples to see what the average person thinks, right? Not just the people who are dominating the conversation online. The second piece of it, and this is what you were hinting at, is that we should be thinking about unintended consequences and externalities. Unintended consequences are like what I just described at Facebook or what you just described in the military. When you change technology, especially an algorithm, right? If you're Facebook and you have 2 billion people using your platform, you need to think not only about what your goal is when you change something in the newsfeed algorithm, but you need to think carefully about like, what are the unintended consequences? What, how can bad actors misuse this or weaponize it or exploit it? And you better have thought through those and ensure that the trade-offs are still in favor of the change you made. And then you should obviously collect data and see if it's working or not. The second thing is externalities. And this is a little bit of like the move fast and break things motto that dominates Silicon Valley and particularly Facebook is they're just constantly moving fast and breaking things. That's how they be innovative and disrupt other industries. And that's just the ethos. And we'll worry about the consequences. But what if the thing they're breaking is democracy? What if the thing they're doing is driving people to park? What if they do the thing they're doing is fostering conflict in families and in societies and in communities? What if it tips over into things like violence or genocide? Those are pretty dramatic harms. When you're breaking things at that level or when you're spreading misinformation about a global pandemic and it leads people to die at this level of millions, that's a level of breaking things that we don't want to accept in society. And so we should be thinking about what are the unintended consequences? Who might be harmed by this? And not just think about how to maximize the profits for our company, because 
guess what? If you burn down society and democracies, eventually you might harm your technology. And this has happened to Facebook. When these things go badly, they get in the news and their, their valuation drops by billions of dollars because it's not good and people disengage from the platform. Young people are using Facebook less and less. And so having a long-term view rather than just kind of like maximizing your quarterly profits by moving fast and breaking things and caring about like the society and community you live in is would be something that would be good to like ingrain in the mindset of these organizations, because I think it's definitely been lacking up until recently. It's interesting that maybe outside of agriculture and farming, I think this tech lobbying is probably the largest lobbying that's going on in our government right now. And so it's always funny for me to see them bring up these CEOs from these four or five companies when they've been lobbied to for the past 20 years and buying into what they're saying. And I'm like, your chance to stop this was a long time ago before you allowed them to lobby as many changes as they've done over the past two decades. But I mean, the, the, what you talk about is almost like what you think about when you think of like all those congressional hearings on like big tobacco. It's like they had been giving so much money and then eventually, and then covering up their harms for a long time. And then you bring them all in Congress and it's a scandal. That's like so late and the, by then the costs are so steep to society. Well, I'm gonna back us up a little bit because I really want the audience to understand some of the science that you uncovered in this book and explain, because this whole podcast is really about teaching people how do you live with intention and our identities are so tied to that in every way possible and one of the things i thought was interesting is through the book you explore that people believe that they have a core self but the fact is each of us contains multiple identities and in your words you say they come in and out of focus at different times meaning who i am at work is going to be different than who I am as a parent or as a sports fan. How are those different identities influenced by groups and how much do the groups that we belong to influence those identities? I mean, that's the core of our book. We're really trying to challenge this notion in, in our society that you have one self. Well, you have a true self kind of buried deep down in there and that guides everything. What we find over and over again, what the research shows is we have multiple selves. So I'll just volunteer myself, but I encourage people to do what we call the I am task. Complete the sentence, I am blank, and do that 10 times. And when I did that, it comes up with things like, I am a father, I am a professor, I am a Canadian, I'm a New Yorker, I am a hockey goalie. And you start to realize you actually have a lot of different identities that are determined by your groups or your roles in groups. And now here's how my day goes. This morning I wake up, and first thing in the morning, I got to get my kids ready and get them to school. And I'm not thinking about work at all. I'm thinking about how I can get them breakfast, get them fed, get them dressed, get them out the door to, to go to school. And then once I've done that, my identity pivots. Then I start thinking about myself as a professor. I have to like log into my email, check my responses. Suddenly I have to be more professional. If I log into a call, I have to be dressed professionally. I don't get to dress like I do when I'm at home as a dad. It starts changes the way I think. I'm not thinking in the same way as I do with my kids. I'm not as paternalistic. I'm more like thinking like a scientist. And then my identity changes again when I come back home at the end of the night and I like turn on the TV and I watch the hockey game. I'm an Oilers fan. When that's on, I'm just like yell yelling in my living room, acting a little bit, uh, unhinged <laughs> compared <laughs> to my like work self or even my parents self. And so even in a day, you go through three or four or five or six of these identities and the group that you're part of changes who you are. The situation you're in changes who you are, changes how you think, changes what you value, changes how you dress, changes how you act. And so what we say is, first of all, you have to understand that. And I would say for people come to grips with it. And then the next thing is, since you have a lot of identities, you can actually be like kind of the architect of another title we had for a book that, that our publisher didn't like was Architect of Identities. You get to be the architect that shapes and lives with a sense of purpose about what identities do you want to have? Do I want to prioritize my father and parenting identity? How about my husband identity? Should I prioritize my work identity or my teacher identity where I think more about how I'm going to be great in the classroom and connect with my students? We only have so much time in our life and in our day. So we have to think about what identities we prioritize and also how we want to act in those identities. And then the second piece of it, which we really encourage people to do is 
Okay, so you have these identities. These are parts of yourself that you value that are groups that you belong to. Think about how you can change those groups for the better. So my professor identity, what can I do to be change the environment around me with the other professors and students we deal with to make their lives more fulfilling, to make their education better, to make them feel valued as a part of our community, to create our community groups. We often think of them as a bunch of mindless conformists, but you can change the norms to be the opposite of that. So can I change the norms where people are comfortable dissenting with me and spreading, creating new and innovative ideas in my research team? And if I do that, then I'm going to get better. Our our work's going to get better. People are going to enjoy it more. And so you get to create the norms and communities that you're part of and shape them in all kinds of ways that can make those things better. And so that's really the core of our book is giving people the tools to understand how identity works, giving them the insight to be more deliberative uh, about cultivating identities that they care about and prioritizing them. And then the next thing is, how can you be a leader in the identity groups that you belong to, to help the other people around you? And so it's kind of like those, I think, are the three key take-homes from our book. Last year, I did a number of solo episodes on the topic of humility, ego, and tact. And it's interesting because even now, they're some of the most downloaded ones I've done, which tells me that they're hot topics for people. But I wanted to ask, how does our intellectual humility and on the other side of that, ego affect where people's identities lie? That's a great question. I'm actually doing a huge project on intellectual humility with philosopher in Australia, Mark Alfano. What we're trying to do is, first of all, understand what is intellectual humility? What are the pieces of it? I'm interested in creating groups that have a sense of intellectual humility. A sense of intellectual humility means that you might have a lot of thoughts that are based on evidence and knowledge, but you're always aware that they're probably not perfect and that you're always open-minded to updating them based on newer and better evidence and insights. And that's how we get smarter. That's how we become better is we accept that we don't know it all and we're always open-minded and ready to learn, but in a healthy way, right? We're not open-minded to any crazy idea. We want to be open-minded to high quality ideas that are based on evidence and experience. The goal for mine is to become better at that, become more comfortable getting constructive feedback and criticism, find ways actually, this is something that's a big part of how I work and run my lab is to not only wait for people to give you feedback, to create situations where it naturally happens. So for example, when I run my research lab meetings, it's about 15 or 20 really smart people, students and postdocs. And if we're working on a paper and I share it and everybody reads it, I don't tell them what I think about that paper first, because I'm in a position of power. And if I have a strong opinion, they might just try to find ways to agree with me. So I prefer to like be silent and ask them what they think and let them go around the room and share all their positions. And they might actually have all kinds of ideas that would disagree with me or insights that I never would have thought of. And by the time I get to weigh in, I've actually updated my thinking almost every time about something because they've covered for my blind spots. They've caught things that I missed. And I allow myself to be update my thinking and have a sense of intellectual humility. But it requires me to create a situation where they feel, the term is psychological safety, where they feel safe expressing their view and opinion and criticism. And so I try to constantly think of ways to create that for them so that they can speak up. And that allows me to update my beliefs. If I created a situation where they didn't feel comfortable speaking up, I would never get negative feedback. And even if I said I had intellectual humility, if no one said anything, I didn't create a situation where people are comfortable saying anything to me, I'd never be able to update my thinking on these topics. Well, it's interesting that you're doing that because I think it is something that needs to be studied a lot more to understand how it is impacting our behaviors. So I can't wait to see what that research is going to show. Well, Jay, one of the things I loved about the way you guys wrote the book, and I think books that do this make their points so much more compelling, is that you interweave stories into each one of the chapters. And in chapter two, You have two different ones that I really loved. One was a 1966 World Cup match between England and uh, Germany, and the other was a Swiss chocolate example. I'll let you pick which one you use, but I was hoping you could go through one of those examples and highlight how those circumstances impacted identity. Yeah, so first of all, yeah, I just want to say I'm glad you love the stories. One of the ways we tried to write our whole book was Every story would teach you something that was backed up by the science. Because a lot of scientists write books and it's like, 
they present us a bunch of science and then they try to find some stories that confirm it or something. We try to lead with the stories to make people interested and make them care and remember it. And so one of the big ideas it was captured in this very famous World Cup final match between Germany and England. And I think it was in the overtime of the game or extra minutes, this English striker shot it and it looked like it might've been a goal, but it wasn't clear because it hit the top crossbar and bounced right down right near the goal line and then bounced out. And it was arguably one of the most controversial goals in the entire history of the World Cup. And I think there was about 400 million people watching that game at the time. So the whole world's watching. And so what ended up happening is the English players all celebrated. They thought it was in and the German players didn't think so. And they thought it was out. And to this day, in fact, here's a funny story about this. We talked about how this is motivated by people's goals. They want to believe and see things that confirm what they want to believe. And so the term for this in psychology is sometimes confirmation bias. But what we argue is that this is determined by our identity. So if ever you're at a sporting event, you filter the game through the lens of what you want to believe. You think that your player is safe when they slide into second base, even though the umpire calls them out. Or you think a goal goes into a net when the ref says, no, it didn't cross the line. And so people are perennially angry at the umpires and the referees. But a lot of that is in the bias of the eyes of the fans, because they're so motivated to see things a certain way that they misinterpret what's going on. And so we wrote this book. We actually have a publisher in England, our book got published in the UK. And that merit also got published in the United States. And so the publisher in the United States read through it to fact check it and make sure there's nothing that was going to get us sued. And they had no problem with that story. That was great. They made some other changes and we published it. We had a separate publisher in the UK who read it and they did not like that story. And because it made it seem like maybe the English fans were biased and they thought that might be like a legal problem. We had a lawyer from- They are biased. Actually make us go through and fact check it a second time because they were really not convinced. We're like, there was this, literally a study at Oxford University where they broke down the video. I got up the video of the goal and watched it like 10 times and paused it to make sure exactly what was happening. It's almost like a religious belief they have in England about this famous goal. I think it was the last time England actually won the World Cup. So it's like a very cherished moment. And so- this is something that is like so sacrosanct and they believe it so much that implying that it wasn't true would be something that could potentially get us sued there. And so this is one of the, it was like really funny to see just how an American audience and a UK audience saw that, that thing today, like 50, 55 years later. And so we would just want to like drive home that you have to be a little bit careful when you have a really strong identity because it can bias the way you're interpreting reality in ways that can lead you astray and very rigid in your thinking. And so that's kind of, we talk about the upside of identity, but we also talk about some of the downsides so people can avoid them. Yes. Well, you definitely have to watch the laws in England because it's kind of 180 degrees different than it is over here. And I recently watched a movie where a Penguin Random House author was sued by someone because she wrote a book about the atrocities of World War II and what happened in the war camps, but more importantly, what happened in the Jewish camps. And an Englishman challenged her that those atrocities never happened. And so she had to go and prove that Auschwitz actually occurred, which she was able to do. It's interesting, even something as black and white as that would come up. I'll tell you, I met her, that's Deborah Lipstadt, who's- Yes, it is, yeah. And so I watched that movie, Denial. It was an amazing movie. And then I was invited to give a talk at a TEDx conference at Oxford. And the whole theme was about truth. And she was the speaker who went right after me. <laughs> and so I talked all about identity and misinformation and conspiracy theories. And she went right after me and gave a talk on this thing. It was one of the best talks I've ever seen in my life. She was so passionate about this. Like you said, I had to go to trial to prove that the Holocaust actually happened, which sounds insane. But yeah, it was a real serious thing. Yes. Unbelievable. Well. I'm going to jump from there to chapter three, because you talk about something here that I lived, and that was Enron. And you discuss the realities around corporate cults, and you used Enron and also Bay of Pigs as examples. So I was working for Arthur Anderson at the time, and I have to say I'm lucky because in a 2,400 person, give or take office, I would say 70% of the employees worked at one time or another on Enron, but we had many other energy clients and other clients. So you couldn't have everyone on there because you needed independence. You bring up this 
corporate culture there. And some of the younger listeners may not understand, and Ron, those my age, your age would definitely understand it. But I knew so many of the people who worked at Enron and who worked on that account from Anderson who were so proud of the company. I mean, when you worked there, you were taught to believe that you were the elite of the elite. And if you were servicing them, you had the best client in the entire world. How was it possible that Kenneth Lay and then his predecessor or then his person who took over from him were able to create this over a decade long period. Yeah, I mean, I'm that's an amazing story. So yeah, we have a whole chapter on how identity shapes beliefs and can lead to cults and conspiracies and organizations that that are disastrous. And Enron is the example, because we found a paper that talked about the cult psychology that was at Enron, and it almost exactly mapped on to the other psychology studies that we were presenting on cults. And so basically, what happened is there was an enormous amount of building people up to feel like they were uniquely special, which is also what cults do, almost like they're the chosen people, almost like a religion. Of course, Enron was one of the biggest, most powerful corporations in the country. It's actually, I think, in history, probably the biggest corporate disaster in American history. And there was also a thing that article gets at is that they made people feel there like they were above the law. And the leaders also had kind of a very cult-like mentality, the way they talked, the way they acted, the way their homes were decorated, the language that they used. And the other thing they did, which was key, I already talked to you about the value of intellectual humility and dissent. They had none of that. They were, <laughs> had more arrogance and hubris and pride, like you just described at Arthur Henderson. And they did not brook any dissent. If you were a dissenter, you didn't 100% support the culture, like a cult follower, you were sent hiking. And so we wrote this chapter on this and I'm like, okay, this is like based on my reading of cult psychology and, and the research I do. And it was also based on this paper that like analyzed the cult psychology of Enron. Then about a couple months ago, I was at a play date with my stepson and he's playing with another kid and we were hanging out and it turned out that the dad worked at Enron. He was in the background of the TV conference, I think that happened right around the time that this scandal wow. broke. And he thought that they were going to be fine. Like he went out for drinks with the CFO at the time. And they're like, I think he told him like Warren Buffett or Warren's going to come in and save us. And so right up until the very last moment, they had so much arrogance that they thought they were going to survive this scandal. And so it was completely crushing because the people who had bought into it so much and were lied to so much didn't, even after all the scandal broke, thought they were fine. He said, what the way he described it almost mapped out perfectly onto my chapter. And he, had a behind, behind the scenes look at everything that went on there. And their relationships, I think with George Bush and prominent people, especially in Houston, they dominated Houston, he said at the time. I think it's like something where we need to have lessons, right? Because when we talk about cult psychology, there are these cults that happen. And we have a study that we present on one of them. But what I care about more is when similar types of mentalities and ways of creating identities happen in groups that we care about, in our community, in our work. And so we need to understand that so we can root those out, so we can develop different norms and procedures and actions that ensure that we don't get caught up in this because they almost always end in disaster. And even when they're ending a disaster, most people who are true believers don't give up on that belief. They'll cling to it to the very end. And so we use the word cult, it has a bad connotation because it's a bad thing. It doesn't usually end well. And Enron's not the only cult. I could go on about other corporations that I think are recent cults. I think I'll just give you two. Another one is Theranos operated a lot like a cult, in my opinion. And that was a billion dollar disaster. And, uh, and then the, another one was uh, WeWorks. Uh, WeWorks is still around, but I think Adam Newman, there's a whole book on him called We Cult. And he created a very like, they had like group chants and retreats. And he created a cult-like environment too, which was an utter disaster. And of course he got incredibly rich off it and escaped as the company crashed. But this is not something that's going away. These are very recent cases. And so organizations that don't look for the signs of this or investors are very likely to head down a disastrous path. Yes, I just can't believe that investors are again giving him money given how badly he misled everyone. That's a disaster. This guy is like a cult leader, even how he runs his organization. Giving him money is like, my guess, like may, you may as well just throw it in the, in your fireplace. Give it to people who need it. If you can donate it to people who could actually use it. <laughs> <laughs> well, 
I'm going to jump to chapter six, which is about overcoming biases. I recently interviewed Dolly Chug, your peer at yeah. NYU, and we talked a lot about biases, but I wanted to ask you this. You write in the book this question of whether implicit biases make you racist or sexist or ageist or biased against any particular group, and it's not answered by whether you have bias, but what you do with the information once you know it. Why is that the case? This is partly a philosophical issue, but a lot of people will reveal some bias on an implicit bias test, but won't act on it in their life. And so is that bias if they score that on a test, but they don't mistreat or treat people differently in their real life? So I think like we have this notion, a very common thing in America, like I don't have a racist bone in my body. What that person's trying to say is like, deep down, I'm not racist or sexist or ageist, but then they'll do racist things in their real life. And so to me, what matters is kind of like how you act. And that's why I think like social norms matter so much. In fact, the sing and I wish we had put this study in our book, it's one of my biggest regrets, is one of the single biggest predictors of your expressions of prejudice is what you think the norms are about other people in your group and their prejudices. And so if you think that it's okay to say negative things about a group, then you it's a, almost perfectly predicts whether you'll say them. And it doesn't matter if you have animosity towards that group, as long as you're engaging in prejudice expressions and behavior, you may as well be prejudiced. And I think that's the thing that we should probably care about a lot more. And also it turns out that's actually an easier thing to change. I did research on this. One of my very earliest studies, my first ever author paper in grad school was on changing implicit bias using shared identities. Turns out there's a huge replication. They found the exact same thing. But when you're changing implicit bias, if you don't keep it up, Within a day, it starts to go back to what it was before. Unless you keep that identity, that the new identity they have kind of active in their mind, they kind of, old ones get triggered and old behaviors get triggered. And so there's a huge amount of money, I think, that's been wasted on implicit bias training and organizations trying to rewire people's biases. What the research shows is far more effective is changing the culture, changing the norms. Because even if people don't change their underlying associations towards groups, their behavior will change. And they can become more inclusive and embrace diversity and become less discriminatory. And so I think like you want to build shared identities, but you also want those identities to have norms of inclusion. And that seems to unlock not only the best, but the least discriminatory behavior by groups, but also other research has found since our book came out, there's a really cool new study that finds if you do this, for example, on college campuses, that the minority students actually perform better. <laughs> All they need to know is that the norms are inclusive and then their grades go up. And their likelihood to stick in their classes goes up. And this is important. I'll tell you why. First of all, because we don't want to waste money on things that don't work. We should actually use the science. Here's the second reason you should care about this and the norm approach. The second reason you should care is because we do the opposite a lot. We talk constantly about norms of discrimination. Although a lot of people are racist or biased. What that does is it signals to people who might not be biased that they should express some bias. And it also signals to people who are the victims of those targeted bias that this is a, an unsafe space for them. And they're less likely to persist and more likely to disengage from the environment and their marks go down, grades if they're in school or the performance decreases. And so you really want to find out if people actually share a belief of inclusion, you want to surface it so everybody knows about it. And then you'll find other people will join in on it. And it makes minority group members feel welcome. So I think like the way that we've been approaching it, I think this is now I read recently, maybe a $66 billion industry is based on not only bad science, but I think the opposite of what science would suggest in some organizations is happening. And so I, I worry about that a lot because I care about these issues and I care about getting them right. Yes. Well, thank you for explaining that because I think it's a very important topic. And I did want to tell the listeners, we don't have time to cover every chapter in your book. I am going to give them a few highlights because I want them to go out and buy it. In chapter five, you discuss underdogs and why do people want to do more than simply support underdogs. In chapter seven, you write about Sylvia Rosalie Jacobson, who is a social scientist who is part of a hijacking. And you talk about how trauma affects shared identities. In chapter eight, you go into the Vietnam War and the Malai massacre and why people often dissent to the people who are exposing the truth and what we can learn from that. In chapter nine, you kind of build upon what we discussed with Enron about leading effectively, which is another great chapter. But I wanted to end on chapter 10, which is the future of identity. And I recently interviewed Seth Godin and I interviewed him about climate change. And I cannot tell you the visceral response I got 
from both sides on this. And I do have to give Seth a lot of credit in that he's not coming at this from any party affiliation. He's trying to be as independent as he possibly can. And he's trying to just lay out the facts as they are on what it is and why we need to act, which I think is admirable. But it's amazing that we are so caught up, I think, in the far extremities and arguing that instead of looking at the big hairy beast that's staring us right in the eye and doing something about it. But you also mentioned climate change in the book, and I thought it was a good thing to end on. How do our national identities impact how we collectively deal with something? It could be climate change, it could be COVID, but let's just use it through the lens of climate change. Yeah, so I tend to think that our national identities, they actually get a lot of slack because we're worried about nationalism and we've had a couple world wars in the last hundred years that were really deadly. But national identities can also be opportunities to bring a broad community together to act on something. And so I think that we need to think about these big challenges and how we're going to tackle them. And they're often aren't easy to tackle with just individual actions. We need those, but that's not enough. And so if we're going to tackle something like a pandemic or a climate change, which is an even bigger problem. We need to mobilize a huge group of people. And so I'll say this, we ran a study in 67 countries around the world. And one of the predictors we found of people willing to follow public health guidelines during the pandemic was how much they identified with their country. And we found this trend in almost every single country around the world with every single measure of behavior. There is variation between some countries and others, but it, on, the trend was universal. And so that suggests that identities can be mobilized for good. And so you can think about this for the pandemic, or sorry, with climate change. Now, the problem with climate change is it's polarized in the U.S. And so this is why you got all this pushback and Seth Godin did. But if you look around the world, it's actually not polarized in most countries around the world. Conservatives and liberals equally support belief that climate change is happening that is caused by humans and are interested in doing something about it. It's polarized in the U.S. because we've made it a party-based issue. And so that's part of the dynamics of the U.S. It doesn't need to be like that. It's not something that conservatives around the world actually deny. It's very much an American issue. And I think a little bit in the Australia and maybe the U.K. too. But almost every other country I've seen the data on, it, conservatives and liberals actually agree on it. And so why do American conservatives not agree? And First of all, I'm going to say that it's something interesting there. I just saw a talk on this last month by somebody who studies climate change. Turns out that actually most Republicans believe <laughs> that climate change is happening. And so actually there is bipartisan support and belief in the issue of climate change. The problem is that there are also a lot of Republicans who don't think it's happening or are in denial about it or disagree. And so they're very vocal and loud. And so they kind of drown out the majority of voices on the right who actually do take it seriously. So when we have these conversations, we need to be nuanced because the, although there is polarization, there actually is bipartisan consensus about the seriousness of the issue and the reality of the issue. And so you don't want to stereotype an entire group as holding these beliefs when actually there's a lot of diversity within these. It's the same with you look at vaccine attitudes in the U.S., most of the people who resisted are Republican, but the majority of Republicans have been vaccinated and a lot of them got vaccinated very early and wanted to. And so there actually is, and a lot of times, and I have friends who are Republican and Republican communities, they feel like they can't talk about it or they'll get socially ostracized or criticized on social media. And so we have to understand the dynamics that happen within groups that make it hard to mobilize action and express the norms that are often in their real behavior that are happening behind closed doors. I think that adds some important nuance about it. But I do think you need national leaders from both parties to mobilize people to make change. Otherwise, it becomes very hard. Okay. Well, and... Jay, if someone wants to learn more about you, what are some ways that they can do that? Great question. So obviously, I think the best thing I'd recommend for anybody if you're interested in these things is buy our book, The Power of Us. But we also have a free newsletter at Substack, Power of Us at Substack. And I read with my co-author, Dominic Packer, and we publish something about once a month, sometimes once a week if we have a lot of time. And we talk about all these issues and we talk about new studies and new findings. We've created some videos that people can watch to learn about these things. We're always kind of sharing the latest evidence on identity and how it works and how it can be used for good. And then finally, if you want to learn more, you can go to Power of Us, which is our website, which has reviews and summaries and link to the newsletter and also links to my personal websites and social media as well. Okay. Well, Jay, thank you so much for taking the time to be here on the show. It was truly an honor to have you. Thanks for having me. Great discussion, great questions. And I really appreciate that you're just like 
thinking deeply and engaging with these issues. I thoroughly enjoyed that interview with Jay Van Babel, and I wanted to thank Jay, the Behavioral Change for Good Initiative, Little Brown Spark, and Hachette Books for giving us the honor of interviewing him. You're about to hear a preview of the Passion Struck podcast interview that I did with Charlotte Burgess Auburn, who has been the Director of Community at the Stanford D School since 2005, where she also teaches classes on self-awareness and creativity and design. She is the author of the new book, you need a manifesto, how to craft your convictions and put them to work. Part of the reason why it is a multi-tool is because it's not so much the end object that is the most important part of a personal manifesto. It's the process of making it and remaking it. The process of beginning it is a process of poking awake your self-awareness, right? <laughs> right. And the more that you continue to work on it in a variety of different ways, the more you begin to know about yourself. The fee for this show is that you share it with family and friends when you find something useful or interesting. If you know someone who's really interested in the science of identity, morality, and all things like that, then please share today's episode with them. The greatest compliment that you can give us is to share the show with those that you love and care about. In the meantime, do your best to apply what you hear on the show so that you can live what you listen. And until next time, live life passion struck.